Welcome to our second Momentum Webinar Advanced Edition. I am Carlos Saavedra, your host for tonight, and this is Paul Engler. Paul, say hi. Hello, everybody. Perfect. Okay. Well, team, just a quick review. As you all of you know, we're not going to go over this much dramatically, but we already have uh, done four basic or introduction webinar series. You can see here's a list of them. You can find them more on our YouTube page, in the Movement Master YouTube page. And you can go and look at it. So we're going to actually be referring back today into a lot of other concepts that we have talked before. So if you feel like, oh my god, I don't know what they're talking about, just go back to the other webinars to go more. Uh, and that brings us to this webinar advanced series. And for the last uh, two weeks, uh, last week we talked about framing the movement successfully, which we talked about how can the movement frame itself around uh, symbolic demands, about action and scenarios, just multiple ways that we can frame the movement so the movement feels victorious and the movement can advance, create more momentum, bring more resources, be more successful, etc., etc. This week, we're going to focus on team structures, specifically decentralized team structures. So pretty much how do we organize the movement? And uh, next week, we're going to do our last one next Tuesday uh, call Actions and Tactics. Um, which you'll get to hear more about dilemma actions and really how to organize the deployment of resources of the movement in the action front. Perfect. So team, let's get started. Again, the team, the, the theme for today is decentralized teams. Uh, and Paul's going to talk to us about the cycle of momentum. So as we were talking before that we are talking about a tradition that integrates both momentum and structure and how those basic things work in a movement is what we call the cycle of momentum. Well, what is a cycle of momentum is that the organization lives off of momentum, but it needs to organize that. So there's a lot of different types of organizations, political organizations, unions, and things. But what we're talking about is an escalating, nonviolent movement that's a hybrid between structure and momentum. And it works through escalating, nonviolent action. So you have an organization that's designed, um, and we're going to go into that design. It's designed to escalate and do nonviolent action. And the more it goes, the more it does actions that escalate and to high levels of escalation. They either do, they do nonviolent action around a popular demand, which either you can do small actions, sometimes bigger actions that create trigger events, and sometimes you hit one out of the park and you create a moment of the whirlwind, like Occupy or like the Global Justice Movement in Battle of Seattle. That creates all this popular support that floods into your movement, and then you have to absorb that into an organization so that you can do it again. And at each of these levels, there is problems to making it work. And what we're going to talk a lot right now is team structures is really about talking about how to create organizations that are designed to absorb the momentum to create stronger movement organizations so that each you can go through this cycle again and again. And with that, there is uh, there's a distinction, and this distinction is really big um, in that um, with structure organizations like unions, or when we talk about the two dominant traditions, uh, we were talking about the, the Alinskyite organizing tradition, but even in unions, in most of the advocacy lobbying organizations, they really have a hierarchical structure. Now, there's a lot of strengths and weaknesses between those two. But if you have a lot of momentum, uh, decentralized structures, like in Occupy, um, even in the Obama campaign experimented a little with decentralized organizations, um, it, it really can create a lot of uh, organization out of momentum. And the, the real distinction between that is how things are coordinated. Because in structure, things are coordinated by leadership, and strategy is given by the top-level 
leadership. So it's almost like the head of the organization is at the top level leadership that, and they have a very complex understanding through experience of what to do, and then they they basically give that knowledge through management and direction to the bottom. Well, in in these decentralized structures, what we have to do is we have to give basic knowledge to every single team, every single person has some strategic knowledge. So everything has a head. And the metaphor that's used for this is, is the starfish and the spider. You might have a lot of teams and either ones. You might have a lot of arms. The organism might have a lot of arms. But in a shellfish, if you break off a piece, it can, it can exist independent of the, the, the central starfish and it can create a new starfish. So the head, the actual organism that uh, knows how to coordinate and knows how to make decisions is everything that's needed to survive is in the leadership at the bottom level of the organization. Thank you, Paul. And I think this takes us to the next piece, which we all have already talked about, which is the ladder of engagement. We're calling it in this regard the decentralized ladder of engagement. So what does this mean? What is this different to the regular ladders that you might have seen? Is that this actual ladder doesn't depend on a centralized body of people for the ladder to function. So for example, it doesn't require it for the permission of the centralized group for this ladder to function. Uh, meaning that people can take online action by what they see, they can take more action just by the things they see on TV or, or by the things that they have been instructed through mass training and people can form teams and become volunteer organizers as much as they can. So in many ways we have to construct a ladder of engagement that's decentralized, that it does not need the permission or the resources of a central body to make it work. Paul, can you talk about the other emerging models? Yeah. So one of the reasons I'm really happy to give this to you is that even though I was really trained in a momentum model, it wasn't until much later on that I realized that there were all these other emerging models that had much more complicated ideas of how to run a decentralized organization. And I had sort of given up on a lot of the models that we experience in like Occupy and that we experience in the global justice movement mm -hmm. that we call the momentum tradition or the clamshell alliance tradition or the direct action movement. Uh, tradition that Barbara Epstein, a, a sociologist, and anthropologist, uh, talked about, which basically this model of how to organize, which is decentralized, but in some ways it wasn't uh, a model I realized that had a lot of the things it needed to survive. I was very frustrated in those movements because they would implode, and so I was really lucky. I I went to a training with uh, Serbian revolutionaries who were part of a decentralized movement. I, we call it the first nonviolent, strategic nonviolent social movement um, because they developed a whole new model which we think is part of these emerging models of decentralized organizations. Now Gandhi and a lot of other people had, um, they knew how to, how to create moments of the world when they knew how to create momentum and they knew how to absorb it but they did it in a different way than these emerging models because they were still much more centralized than the new models. And some of these new models are coming out because of these breakthroughs in science that is telling us um, basically how nature organizes. And, there, and th that's uh, also called uh, organic systems theory, which is giving businesses a lot more complex understandings of how to run decentralized organizational structures. There is also the open source movement, which is the new technology of the internet allows for mass dissemination without centralization. And that has opened ourselves up to all these different organizations that can, can coordinate themselves in a decentralized way and are now competing with some of the biggest technology firms and corporations and winning. A good example would be Wikipedia or Lennox. And there's a lot of different things that, um, that come out of this, these sort of organizational forms. And even from those organizational forms has, uh, that has been able to create alternative models for pro making computer programming that is free and accessible to people, 
um, there has taken that technology and applied it to political parties. And the one we talk about is the, mm -hmm. the Pirate Party in Sweden and is spread all over Europe, which is using a lot of the open source um, ideas. Uh, the evangelical Christians have a model that has been very successful and tried out in different areas um, uh, that uh, Alan Hirsch and um, Michael Frost, who are big thinkers, they call this the missional movement. Some U.S. political parties, even Obama, has been really experimenting with how to do decentralized stuff. But one of the greatest models of doing this has been the 12-step movement in the United States, which is um, Bill W., the founder of that movement, believed and talked about how that movement was a very anarchist, decentralized model. He even acknowledged that it came from some anarchist mutual aid models that he was studying in other popular movements uh, at the turn of the century. So what we're talking about is how do we create a model that does civil resistance, strategic escalating nonviolence that integrates structure and momentum. And we're, we're really borrowing from all these different traditions. We, we're taking best practices from these different traditions. But the cornerstone of, a decentral, of almost all these decentralized models, whether it's 12 steps, um, the U.S. political, the missional movement, the pirate party online, um, is what we call the team structure. That's the cornerstone of what uh, a decentralized organizational structure looks like and so we're gonna we're, we, we're, we've already talked about in our past webinars about decentralized organization in the 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 new uh, decentralized model that we propose the new hybrid model that we propose but we're gonna really get into the nitty-gritty in one aspect of that which is team structures um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about team structures and how that fits into these emerging models. So there, there are a lot of reasons why movements choose decentralized teams over centralized teams, okay? And um, so the biggest one is that when you have a lot of momentum and you have a moment of the whirlwind, like I experienced in 2006 with the immigrant rights movement, we literally had 1.2 million people marching. Um, a huge portion of the city participated in a general strike, and we did not have the organizational forms. Our organizational forms that were coordinating most of the, the, the marches were centralized. A lot of it came out of uh, CHIRLA and, and uh, the County Federation of Labor and the coalition of all these different organizations. Well, they weren't designed to absorb. If we had a team structure, we probably could have absorbed people and given people little bits of initiative and created more, a more sustainable structure to, to get it. But the team structure, we didn't even have the lowest level of the ladder, of the decentralized ladder of engagement, which was we didn't even have an email list with everybody and we weren't collecting that. So, but if we did that, uh, we did have a million point two, it would have been the most powerful email list of the immigrant rights movement. And you that was just huge. in LA. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's just in L.A. We're not even talking about the, the another 8 million that marched in cities across the country. So, but once you have that email list, how do you actually get it so that people are doing things? So that the, the movement isn't led by the, the top-level leaders. And I think a good example of this is a lot of the activity, once the momentum was really hot, was um, these students doing walkouts in high schools, right? And they kind of formed themselves into little teams, but we didn't have a process of ab absorbing them, supporting them, and whatever. So in the student, the Serbian uh, revolutionary movement in Nagpur, what they realized, too, is that they had a student movement with general strikes that was incredibly effective at getting massive amounts of students involved, but they realized to be sustainable other than just one big-ass action, they had to form people into teams. And so... Expanding exponentially into an organizational form is really helpful if you can form teams. But that's one reason why people really do the team structure. The second one, and this was very big in the OCTCOR, which was the um, this student uh, revolutionary movement, I believe the first sort of open source or emerging movement that used a lot of these technologies that have been since borrowed and and evolved since then, 
is that they had a problem with their student strikes is that they actually won quite a bit and gained a lot of popularity, but it, it made the leadership very vulnerable, and they were in a dictatorship. So uh, this dictatorship by Milosevic, he was, he was called the butcher of the Balkans. He, he did uh, these huge and brutal um, wars uh, that killed lots and lots of people, and he would they would beat and torture people. They would uh, people would disappear as leaders, and also they would there was a system of corruption where they would buy off leaders of the movement and give them positions and stuff. And so what they realized is they weren't going to do that again, where they had a big student general strike and then their leaders got bought off or disappeared. So they needed to create a structure that wasn't dependent on the top level leaders. And so they realized that the decentralized organizational structure was a way to resist the, the attacks from leaders. And this is especially important in not just uh, Serbia, but in many of the places where these emerging movements have have come out, um, the attacks on leaders have 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 been uh, really brutal. Like if you go to Burma or you go to um, you go to many of of these uh, revolutionary movements that are trying to overthrow dictators, and in in Egypt right now um, they are attacking the the great leaders. So if you have a decentralized team-based structure, it's much easier for the shellfish, even if it, if it has a, an arm chopped off, it can grow again. It, can, it, it doesn't need the central body to survive. So it makes you much more resistant to attack. Amen. I love that one, Paul. And the last one that we would say I think, Tim, is the big reason why people do decentralized teams is because it's creativity. Because there is tons of, there's tons of stuff to do in the movement, right? And how many of us have been in a moment when we have to wait for somebody at the top to give us permission? Hey, can we talk about this? Can we say about that? And it's just, it's such a downer on creativity. So people do decentralized things because it allows hundreds of people to do a lot of stuff and be creative about it. And actually, it provides new things that you didn't even think that the movement could do. People can do it because they're thinking of the movement differently. You know, of course, using boundaries and stuff that we'll get to talk about in a second. So let's just do a quick review, Paul. Well, I just want to say about this creativity thing, I think one thing in Occupy that was really interesting, in, you know, it had a decentralized organizational structure that we're going to go into a little bit that had some weaknesses. But some of the strengths of it was that people, I, I remember this website, this open source website with all the posters, of, and that people had like an open source um, way in which they could download and share all the posters that, different people developed all around the country. And working on a national campaign around a hotel boycott uh, for the United uh, Unite Here, which is the union low-wage uh, workers that work at hotels and restaurants, we, we, we would take all this time trying to find artists and recruiting them for them, and we had to pay sometimes to, to, to develop posters. Now, all of a sudden, everyone feels part of the movement, and everyone gets to develop posters. And now we have... We have, there's hundreds and hundreds of posters that are better than anything we could have centrally coordinated. And that's just one example, but there's a thousand of them, of how if you unlock the magic to give people autonomy, they don't need to be paid. Um, they, they, don't, they, can, they can use their creativity to help the movement uh, in a way that is magic. Just like Wikipedia, like how many people, how much knowledge is coordinated millions of people, all with different knowledge, can creatively contribute to developing this encyclopedia that is like one of the, the biggest portals, it's the biggest website on the internet, one of the biggest websites on the internet because it, it actually um, absorbs the creative power of hundreds of thousands of people. So Perfect, thank you Paul. So Tim, let's review because I think this part for us is key before we move forward. Uh, there is a specific reason why we want to do the centralized teams, and I don't know about you, but I get freaked out when we hear that suddenly anybody in the movement is going to do anything they want, because that's what sometimes decentralization means. You know, it's like, well, you mean that I'm going to let my baby strategy go, and people are going to be able to mess with it, and I'm like, holy guacamole, I guess, yes. <laughs> and anytime you think about, well, if I'm giving up the control, why the heck am I giving up the control? And we're going to repeat it, it's because of three reasons. 
the reasons that what uh, not essentially you're gonna give up the control, but you're gonna extend that control to more people. <laughs> you know, you're gonna share the control with a lot more people. And the first reason, as we said, is absorbing momentum. And to us, this is big because what is the whole point of creating popular support and getting a lot of people excited if they cannot join your movement? I mean, that's to us is just key, right? The second piece uh, is that the movement becomes somewhat immune to the attack on the leaders of the movement. To us, that's very key. Like, for example, what if the opposition arrests most of the leaders of the movement? How is the movement going to continue to operate? So we know that we cannot just be dependent on us. We have to be dependent on more people so they can continue the struggle. And the last one, which Paul said very clearly, right, we really need creativity. Why? Not just for the sake of people doing cool graphics, which graphics are great, but also to bring significant amount of resources into the organization without, uh, you know, that we wouldn't even expect. So those are, again, the three reasons for decentralization. We're going to get back to those in a bit. Uh, but, Paul, it would be exciting if you get to talk about two examples right now, you know, one being the Pirate Party uh, and then... You know so we're going to talk a little bit. There's many different types of, um, of people that they're sort of that experiment a little bit more with decentralization, or they're more hierarchical. They're somewhere on the spectrum. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I, I think what I want to really talk about is that even if you have teams, that doesn't mean that those teams are decentralized. Because first thing, what is a team? A team is that People organizationally are thinking of making decisions and doing work as a team instead of as an individual. And that's a huge thing that many organizations have realized is very important. And right now in the tech sector, in political parties, right, right now in the Obama campaign, um, in, all over the place, even in centralized organizations, even in hierarchical organizations, people are like, we love teams. Teams are helpful. They're more creative. They're better. They work better. In the tech industry, in a lot of creative industries where you need people to be very creative about computer programming, they realize that it, it works better if you have people in teams, okay? But that is different. And, like, for example, I want to say the Pirate Party, okay? So the Pirate Party was um, developed in Sweden and it used open source technology uh, to form this party. And really, the party had no resources and very, very little resources. And what it did is it created a vision and container and then it allowed everyone to join that wanted, kind of like Wikipedia. And really, it gave tons of autonomy to people. Now, this is different than the Obama camp was a little bit it's more decentralized than a lot of other, though. Obama campaign of 2008 was very decentralized compared to a lot of other political structures, but those teams were very disciplined and had much less autonomy than the Pirate Party. Or if, if you go into, um, even if I formed teams in the labor movement, I formed teams, canvassing teams, those teams are very dependent on the grassroots campaign that's coordinated through a campaign coordinator. And the Pirate Party Really, the, the campaign coordinator is really just supporting the teams. The teams are the ones who are leading the campaigns. They're, they're doing everything. And the Pirate Party, Swarmwise is this amazing book written about the Pirate Party that sort of explains in many ways how the team structure of this decentralized organization is very different than traditional team structures in party organizations. Another one that I, I think is very helpful to look at is, like I said, that in Windows, they still use a team structure like Windows or um, Mac or these other tech companies. A lot of times have have teams to develop um, programs, but Linux is very different because the teams are formed organically. Uh, they, they do create a whole ecosystem, and there are many leaders that that lead people lead a group to work on something. So a lot of it is still done in teams, but the difference is that the teams are the ones that run the organization and that do stuff from the bottom up instead of the top down. So there's a difference between teams. Just because we're saying teams doesn't mean that um, it, is, it is decentralized, but we're talking specifically about decentralized teams, and that's really what we're going to go into in the next part of this webinar.
Thank you, brother. So, team, again, that is just the first part of this 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 webinar that we're saying, which is about decentralized teams, understanding the reasons why we're doing decentralized teams, uh, and then for you to see some other examples. We just want to make sure that you know that this is not something we're making up or something that we're saying. Well, this is something you can do. No, this is actually emerging in multiple fields. And in the business world, it's going crazy. I mean, there's a, the recent thing with the X teams. I don't know if you have heard about that one, Paul. No. But there is the X teams is this new theory that a professor from MIT has been putting for some time now about uh, open teams. I mean, it's the same thing as having decentralized teams that people can come in and come out. I mean, it's similar stuff that we're seeing in multiple fields. Uh, team, now you would say, okay, well, Carlos and Paul, okay. I understand. I want to do this movement stuff, and I understand I gotta have these decentralized teams. Well, how the heck do we do it? <laughs> Which I think is the biggest question, right? So we actually think there is two elements. Again, we talked about structure and momentum in the first webinar. So now we're gonna talk about unity and autonomy, and that we think that sometimes these two qualities sometimes are separated, but they need to be complementary towards each other. So let's go deeper into this, right? So for example, if you put uh, different teams in a spectrum from to the left side to be more decentralized and on the right side to be more centralized, meaning teams that are more focused on, on having a lot, a lot of centralization, meaning that a few top leaders are pretty much running the whole show, versus the decentralized, which we, we put here, for example, some of the Occupy Wall Street General Assemblies, where anybody can join, anybody can make a decision, right? Everything is run to consensus. Our claim here is that if you go really to the middle, both from the centralized side, if you go from the centralized to the left, then you start creating unity in a context of unity on strategy, unity on what that movement is going to do. To us, that's very, very important. The second element is that if you start from the decentralized matter and you start going more to the middle to kind of having more balance, you're going to have to have more autonomy. So really what we're trying to get is to this middle ground where you can have a lot of high amounts of autonomy, as Paul puts it, and high amounts of unity at the same time. But then you would say sometimes to me and to Paul, well, Carlos, you are insane. How can you have autonomy when you have to have unity? And how do you have unity when you know you want people to do whatever they want and have autonomy. We're going to show you what is specifically we mean. What are the boundaries that can create that complementation? Okay. So again, I want to just go through the spectrum for a second. You can see that we have put, this is just to put examples here, kind of in most centralized kind of union worker committees, very centralized. You need an organizer on top of it. Then we have put the Obama campaign teams even more on the centralized side, right? But also very also to the middle, having a lot of union, also having some autonomy. Uh, we have put some of the Dream Act teams uh, that I was a part of building that I think have more autonomy than unity sometimes. There's unity in meta branding, and you will see some of the aspects here. But still, the teams are very autonomous because that's how we create them because we didn't have a lot of resources to support all the teams at the same time. Uh, and of course, I already talked about the Occupy General Assembly. Uh, Paul, is there anything you want to add to this spectrum? Well, I think that's good. I mean, you could fit a lot of different types of organizations from the civil rights movement. SNCC was more decentralized. SCLC, Martin Luther King's organization, was much more centralized, even though those organizations were very momentum-driven organizations. They were more on the momentum side than the structure side um, right. of the two dominant traditions in the United States of America within organizing. And you can find uh, very structured organizations that are more decentralized. Yes. Uh, so it, it, um, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ways of thinking about that. Yes. It's not just momentum and structure, but it's also talking about central and decentralization. And there's a lot of examples of decentralized um, momentum organizations, and there is some examples of structured um, mm -hmm. uh, decentralized organizations and vice versa. Well, just to add one more point before we go into the most common problems, is that you have to understand, team, that the main reason, like if we put the whole thing in context, the main reason why we're saying we got to do decentralized teams is to absorb more people into the movement. That's the whole end of the game. That is the big part of this thing. It's absorbing, creating a lot amount of capacity. So 
we just want to point out that, that if you have an organization that has a hundred committed leaders, let's just say that, you can create momentum. You can go nuts. You can organize massive civil disobedience with a hundred people. They can recruit another hundred people, etc. That's not what we're arguing here. What we're arguing here is that, well, if you have a hundred, you have a two hundred people action, you create some momentum. How the next time around you have a thousand people in your organization? If you don't have decentralized team structure, you're not going to be able to absorb. You're going to either remain the 100 people or you might even get less people because now you lost some capacity because some people are burned out. So this is, I just want to put that out there, this is why we keep saying that we got to do this stuff. It's really to go through the last part of the cycle, which is the absorption cycle. Without this, we cannot do the absorption piece and we cannot grow and escalate much more. So, okay, I just wanted to say that. I hope that's okay. Good, good. So, Paul, talk to us about some of the most common problems. So, when we say you need high levels of autonomy and unity, what we mean is that if you have too much autonomy without unity, you get lots of people doing lots of different stuff that actually end up being at conflict with each other. And you see this time and time again in different movements, okay? And we went over this, uh, and we're going to go over this more if you go to uh, our our training in June or in the third webinar, or no, the fourth webinar that we went over, which we talked about the common problems, and we talked about the cult problems, which is that if you have lots of autonomy, different people in different countercultures start fighting for their own counterculture and their own ideology of change. And there's a lot of different theories of change, and so they each fight for them. And those different theories of change end up developing different messages, they end up uh, developing different strategies, they ended up, um, they end up also having a different theory of how to create change which creates different actions. So, um, for instance, there is uh, a problem a lot of times with giving lots of autonomy out and then there's a counterculture that is maybe a, a an, an anarchist counterculture. There's many anarchist countercultures, but an anarchist counterculture that that really believes in individual expression as the end goal, you know, or as a major goal, and that diversity of tactics is something to do. So they punch cops, they hand out flyers uh, where they, they advocate for punching cops in the face and running away, or, or breaking windows of Starbucks. And this actually happened in the global justice movement, is that we, uh, even, um, and we're going to go over those, but there was a lot of loss of, of, of the um, of unity. So if there's too much autonomy, there's a loss of unity, and people can do all this crazy stuff, and it isolates it from the movement. And we call these cult problems. We're going to talk uh, about them in a different um, a different webinar. And if there's too much unity, then uh, there's there's control problems. And what I mean by control problems is lots of people can't get involved. There's bottlenecks of decision making. Uh, there's too many resources to manage all the activity, and there's too much professionalization. The staff is the one who's driving it. It's not a bottom-up organization. And um, you know, we could we could talk about examples of of sort of those problems of too much autonomy without unity or too much unity. We're going to go over some examples now. Thank you, Paul. So, team, no, let me switch here. So, team, what happens? Uh, or how do we give teams high levels of autonomy? So we actually think there is a couple of ways. We can actually th probably think of tens or twentieths of examples of how do we give people more autonomy. The first one is we're calling it given the list, and you're going to see an example about this, but I don't know if all of you remember, but in the Obama campaign in 2008, this was this big deal because Obama had all this momentum. I don't know if you remember through after the New Hampshire campaign, after Iowa, et cetera, et cetera. And all these people were walking into Obama's offices and saying, I want to help. People were calling from random neighborhoods and saying, I want to help, I want to sign up. And they were thinking, how the heck do we get people to do more? And at some point, they did something very revolutionary, which actually even my mom did calls, my aunts did calls. I mean, and how, what happened is Obama pretty much, the Obama campaign said, look, we're going to give you the list, not the whole thing, but we're going to give you a segment of the list, 10 or 20 names. You call them, you input the things that you have had, and it goes into a system. And then if you want to do more calls, we'll give you more of a piece of a list. Now, people had a whole fight in the Obama campaign to get this list released because some people were, like, of course, scared 
you don't want to give a whole list of voters and people messing up. Maybe are people from the opposition, they can put other stuff in the list. I mean, it's a big deal, right, to give up kind of that kind of autonomy of your list of your supporters. But they did that, and that created, if not thousands of new people, generating hundreds of thousands of calls to more supporters. And people even working just individually from their computers, getting on the phone, talking, dialing again, and boom, and inputting the information. So that's, for example, one way to create more autonomy. Another way that I think it's pretty cool is allowing permission to do stuff. And I really love this uh, quote right here by, uh, I can never say his name. I need, to, I need to improve my English skills here. Oh, wait, is it showing up there? Oh, there you go. It's by Rick Falkovich. Is that how you say it, Paul? I think that's Thank you it. so much. Thank you so much. You know, I'm, I'm a little conscious as a, as a Latino immigrant here. But he says... In the Swedish party, we had manifested this through a three-pirate rule, which can easily be translated into a three-activist rule, activist, a three-activist rule for any swarm. It went like this. If three activists agree that something is good for the organization, they have a green light to act in the organization's name. It's not that they don't need it is not that they don't need to ask permission. It goes deeper than that. Rather, they should never ask permission if three activists agree that something is good. Now, this is, think about this. In one side, this is crazy because you're saying like any three people in any part of the country can use your branding of your organization, your strategy, and do whatever the heck they want. First of all, don't you want to know what they're going to do with it? That's crazy. Right? But on the other side, think about it. So you do a crazy action. You know, you did a hundred people civil disobedience. You're amazing, but you're in freaking jail. <laughs> You, nobody can reach you out. There's no conference calls, none of that stuff, right? But a hundred or five, I'm sorry, 500 people see you on TV. Or maybe thousands see you, but 500 see you and they say, I want to do something. Think about that. They just have to find two more friends and they can form a team. Isn't that freaking amazing? You get out of jail 10 days later and you have 400 more teams. How the heck does that work? So, but if people do not understand the rule from the beginning, even before you went to jail, like when you have to front load the whole movement, it's just really difficult for us to do. So this is to us another way of how to create more autonomy. Uh, Paul, do you want to go to the next slide? So what happens when you have tons of, of autonomy without unity? Okay, so, and I think we talked about this in Occupy. So Occupy allowed everyone to affiliate. Everyone could, uh, any different Occupy group could, could take the name and develop their own principle. And so what you had is in Occupy Oakland, you had this, this organization that embraced diversity of tactics. Um, they started developing their own messages. This is uh, something that we, we talked about in webinar three. There was this is Fuck the Police rallies, the weekly rallies that Occupy o Oakland endorsed, um, which were incredibly uh, unpopular to the United States of America. This is not good messaging if you want to create a popular movement. Um, in, they also had in Occupy uh, Oakland a lot of uh, people breaking windows. They, and this, this stuff was uh, videotaped, put on YouTube, the right wing, Fox News loved the fact that they were throwing um, grocks at cops and um, there was, in my experience in the global justice movement, I wish I could say that it was just agent provocateurs, which there are agent provocateurs. There's many examples and even in Occupy, there were agent provocateurs that wrote for right wing, right -wing publications saying that they went into Occupy to uh, destroy it through doing violent acts. And I experienced that in the global justice movement uh, at the uh, world, the FPAA, which was this kind of NAFTA-like uh, trade agreement that was in Quebec City. They were negotiating it. And there were actually competing general assemblies, one that believed in diversity of tactics and one that believed in nonviolence. I, I saw people throw mobtail cocktails at the police. It was incredibly unpopular. Uh, that sort of violent action was incredibly unpopular, unpopular and isolated us from the public. Um, we did win some things, but it was counterproductive to the movement. Well, so 
you have to think, if you give people too much autonomy, then you can lose control and things can go haywire. And these are examples of how movements have sort of done that. Um, but I also want to say uh, around the, uh, the um, oh no, we'll get to that later, sorry. So those are examples. <laughs> I know, we all want to get too quickly to the, all the answers. Well, before you go, Paul, in the next part here, it's like, so we talked about a lot of autonomy. We said there's the three uh, people rule. We talked about um, a lot, giving people the list, which is this concept from the Obama campaign that we're putting here. Paul talked about, well, what happens when you give a lot of autonomy without unity? Well, we can see that pretty much is chaos. I mean, uh, really a disorganized movement. Uh, but now the question becomes then, well, how do you give people lots of unity to your teams? So if you have a lot of autonomy, we figure out a couple of ways. Now let's balance the equation and let's give a lot of more unity to the teams, right? Uh, one way that we think we can do that is to do in boundaries and principles. Uh, and what that means, for example, one, for example, one principle of that would be nonviolent discipline, meaning that our movement by no means will do violence. And I know we talked about this repeatedly in other trainings, and we're bringing it up here again, because if your movement doesn't have this front-loaded, meaning as an agreement from before, it is so much easier to do it later. You know? So, for example, that is one principle. Another principle that we have already said that could be, it's like three people can form an organization. That's a principle that you can establish from the beginning. You know, so... Um, and, and we'll go actually right now in a second when Paul goes in, into what are multiple ways of doing both unity and autonomy. So you can see what's the best model that we're doing, right? Uh, but actually, Paul, can you explain the sandbox uh, metaphor? Because I think you explained it better than I do. Sure. So the ideal is that we want high levels of unity and autonomy, okay? And the way uh, Oxpor revolutionaries from Serbia explain it to me is like a giant sandbox, okay? where everyone gets a sandbox and they can play in the sandbox and do whatever the hell they want, but there's clear boundaries to that sandbox. And what that allows people to do is it allows them to do as, as much as they want to with, without permission, but it confines it so that it doesn't hurt other people. So how do you give the most amount of autonomy without hurting other people or the movement. And so you have to create really strict boundaries. But within the boundaries, you've got to empower people and give people the tools to build giant sandcastles or whatever they want to build. Uh, so that's the concept, is how do you, and most of these emerging movements have, 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 have seen this, and we call this front loading. But what front loading is, is giving people parameters and and giving, anticipating the problems and giving people the boundaries and the traditions and everything so that they can have the greatest amount of autonomy but also have enough unity so it doesn't hurt each other. And team, this is the model or what we consider the model of team integration, right? Integrating again autonomy and unity. So let's review it. So Paul, give us some of the stuff and I'll, I'll, I'll share my points as well. So when we're talking about this uh, model, the hybrid model in the team structure um, right now, we're talking about specifically how that applies to team structures, but uh, what we need to do is really create a front-loaded DNA. And that's going to include central elements that all the teams can use without permission that gives them some ability um, to be united with the movement. And that is like a common story, a meta brand, a meta narrative. You can see that in Occupy. They had a, a meta brand that gave everyone the power and legitimacy of the movement. They had the same narrative, like in Occupy, we are the 99% strategy that wasn't in, there wasn't a grand strategy or a common theory of change within Occupy or the global justice movement. So we believe um, like other emerging movements, like Oxpor, that you need a common theory of change and grand strategy, and you need a structure, uh, which is teams, nonviolent discipline, plan format, which is giving people a ritual of how to think through actions that accord with the strategy, 
mass training and online infrastructure. Um, but you also need to train them on how to do autonomy. So they have the common DNA, but they need to learn how they can have autonomy. And a lot of organizations don't do that. Even Occupy didn't really do that. And what does that mean? It means that you have to teach people that they don't need permission. They can vote with their feet and with participation. As long as they're acting within the DNA, they can run a campaign. And the, the campaigns that are the most popular at the base of the movement end up um, getting a critical mass and building momentum, and more and more people start doing them. And that's what we call voting with your feet. Decisions are not made because people, all the teams are having to enter into consensus with each other, that people just do things that are within the DNA, and the best stuff rises to the top because people vote with their feet. And anybody who participates can form a team. And we, we're going to talk a little bit about, about how you emphasize that within your movement. But it, this is a real problem in Occupy a lot of times, and it wasn't as much of a problem in the global justice movement where everyone was in a affinity group, and that changes the dynamic when everyone realizes that they participate not as an individual but as a small team, three people can be a team, and that ideally you want people to form um, teams of four to 12 people to do anything because that's the most efficient way for people to do things. And, and there's a lot of sociology, there's a lot of science that backs up having around eight to 12 people making decisions is the, is, the, is the practical size of group. So you need to break up responsibilities and roles and things in your movement into groups of around uh, eight to 12 people. And you also need to make sure that there's principles, and we, we say principles that inoculate, vaccinate, anticipate the most common problems. Um, that exists within the movement, and each team needs to have that as part of their culture from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. So, team, this is pretty much the model of team integration. So, I just want us to take kind of a deep, deep breath, uh, and we're going to go into the last part, which is creating good team, a good team ecosystem. So, how how do we sustain and harvest all this team uh, resources that will emerge from the work of the movement? But before we do that. We want to take a little pause, but Linda, it will be good if you can come back and just we would like to hear from some of the participants. What are some of the things that are cutting your attention that are saying, oh, that's good, that's interesting. So what's hot? What are you liking? But also what's confusing? What's something? Well, I don't really understand that. Can you elaborate more on that? Uh, so again, before you go, Belinda, just a quick, a quick give back in what we've been talking about. We've been talking about unity and autonomy as being two integrative elements that we need to have for, for doing decentralized teams. And of course, we talked about the main reason for doing decentralized teams is because we want to absorb momentum, get more capacity so we can escalate more. So go ahead, Bob. Great. Um, so yeah, so if you have any comments about you know what you found really, really helpful or what is unclear to you or what you want to hear more about, um, let us know. Submit a question and we'll unmute you and you can talk. Or you can just submit the question and we'll respond to it. Or if well, anything, or if anything that we talked about reminds you of an organizing experience, that's that's interesting and helpful for us too. I actually have a comment on that. If no one's going to submit anything, or while while we're waiting, I I, I was cracking up, uh, Carlos and Paul, when you guys were talking about the Obama campaign and how they made the list like publicly accessible because yes. uh, back in my like you know climate justice affinity group organizing days like direct action kind of stuff uh, we were actually bothering the organizing for America offices a lot and we realized that too that we had access to their list and we were like maybe we'll send something to the whole list like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah it was. I remember when we realized that we were like, "Oh my gosh, we can do this." Um, so Leland just submitted a comment. He said, um, "Hmm, how do you know what basic identity boundaries are going to resonate with most people?" Mm. Is that this enough? Do you want cool. him to elaborate on that? Yeah, no, be quick. I think that's. Okay. I, I would love for more elaboration. Maybe uh, Leland, if you can okay, speak cool. up, that would yeah, be I'm gonna, excellent. Leland, I just unmuted you.
There we go. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm wondering, like, um, because, like, um, there's really not that much more than, than just that in the question. But, like, one thing that occurred to me was, like, the man who find, founded the Pirate Party, like, he essentially wrote everything himself. Um, or maybe he didn't. Um, but um, how do you, how do you um, get community, f how do you get feedback from the kinds of people who you hope to involve on what um, basic identity and mission statements will, will resonate most with them? Um, with that, or yeah, I guess that's basically it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have an answer, Paul. But what are you feeling? Uh, okay, you could shoot, and then I maybe I could pin you back off you. Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, I think Leland, this is really the hard part of the front loading process, and uh, which is that uh, you, we usually with Paul and Belinda to know this, we're calling it this an investigation process. There's, I think, before you launch your movement, there's really a moment where you really have to do an investigation, not just yourself, but we think with a core team, which is what we're gonna get to in this this next part of the presentation, right, with a group of people they can really be the creators and the protectors of the DNA of the movement. But then in the process, you have to do a lot of investigation, a lot of feedback and listen to other people to say, does this make sense? Does this resonate with people? And that goes from everything, from like the strategy of the movement to what is the narrative of the movement, the story, and also to what is the structure, right? What will be a structure that people will feel good around? So that would be my answer to your question. Angler? Well, I, I would just add to that is that People vote with their feet, okay? So um, when the, the free software movement uh, in open source, they, th there was a core leadership that created a huge portion of the DNA for the open source movement. And for anything to get off the ground in the open source movement, they need to create a kernel or a source code that allows everyone to participate. And in the Pirate Party, uh, you know, he, he had to create a vision and a meta narrative, and then people vote with their feet. Now, lot, there's going to be lots of cores and lots of people forming campaigns and visions. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. Um, there could be a lot of movement out there, but it actually empowers people to give them some basic source code, and people jump onto um, a team when they feel that the movement is effective and they have permission to do a lot, but they're not uh, having to deal with like an Occupy Oakland or crazies who are subverting your movement and stepping on everybody's toes. So when you give people some of that structure, some people rebel about it, and that's okay, but they choose not to join the movement. But it empowers more people to join the movement. How many people were isolated by Occupy trying to get a decision through a general assembly of over 100 people. They felt they had to show up to four-hour consensus meetings to make a small little decision around doing a march that they could have done and mobilized tons of people without the permission of the assembly. But because the structure didn't empower people, it isolates lots of other people. So, um, the front-loading process is, in some ways, developed by a core, um, not developed by everyone. And that investigation process really is about trying to make sure that the front-loading is, is, um, is well worked out to meet the needs of everybody. Nice. Thanks. Well, I got a lot out of both of those answers. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Belt, should we continue or? Yeah, we haven't received any of the questions. Perfect, perfect. I know that 3,000 people that are waiting to be absorbed into the webinar are just so excited about the last part. So let's just go through it. Actually, to be fair though, a lot of people said that they're gonna, they're looking forward to watching the recording. So. Oh, if you're a person which in the future is watching this and you have a question, just say it to this guy and we'll get it in about two days. Okay, <laughs> let's continue. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. We're going back to part three. We know we love you here in the Momentum webinar series. So creating a good ecosystem. Uh, so Paul, this is your part, then I'll go through the crazy mastering. Well, 
this webinar, we, we're talking about a lot of things about the hybrid model, which we say is a decentralized, momentum-driven organizational structure that can do the cycle of momentum. But really, this last part is the cornerstone of this webinar. And I really wish when we would have had some of these lessons when we launched 99 Rides, because it's really the details of, okay, so now we have these structures, we know we're decentralized, how do we, how do we actually do that? And the first thing you have to say is that you have a core leadership, and a core leadership does the front loading and creates the DNA that all the teams are going to use. And they do that by both creating it, modeling it, so they function as a team, and, and other people can see them and see how they function as a team. But they also launch the first training, which allow people to, to initiate them and to form teams. Um, they're not this vanguard. They don't, they're shepherds of the DNA and of, of the movement. They're supporting the ecosystem. Um, this is very different than how leadership functions in hierarchical organizations. Um, the, the leaders do not have power over people. They cannot command. They cannot govern. But what they do is they protect the DNA and disseminate the DNA, and then they also do lots of different things to um, support both the formation of new teams, because a lot of times that doesn't happen naturally through the bottom up. They need to help new teams form. But another thing they do is they sustain and support the teams that are already going on. That's what the core leadership does. And we, we talk about that as shepherding. Um, which is a very different idea. Uh, another metaphor that's used, uh, the pirate party uses, is, is helping support the swarm. Right? The swarm is that all the different bees each have intelligence, but you're trying to help the swarm, create the good, the, the good organization. Another model that I like is if you're a farmer, right? You help seed the plants, you pick out the weeds, you water it, you give it good fertilizer, but in the end, each plant grows of its own intelligence and you help the plants um, have a good ecology. But Paul, you want to talk about this piece too? This is yours. Sure. So the first thing is when you're talking about a team structure is you, the core really needs to support um, bottom-up innovation. Um, and what, that, what, what I mean by that is that um, you have to find uh, when you actually start having teams, you got to see what's out there in the teams and help the best ideas and the best practices float to the top by advertising them, by uh, doing things that support uh, the bottom. Uh, and what we call that is bottom-up innovation. And that's different than top-down innovation, which is the core actually developing ideas and, and, and making sure everybody does it, which sometimes you need to do. Um, but when, when also what I'm talking about is from the get-go, front-loaded into the whole movement DNA, is the importance of groups to everyone. And you make it essential to decision-making and participation. In the pirate party in Sweden, to make decisions, you need to have three people making decisions. In the global justice movement, after the battle in Seattle in 99, if you wanted to participate in spokes councils that were making decisions about everything in the movement, you had to be part of an affinity group. And if you didn't have an affinity group, you can join an affinity group of a lot of uh, people that all didn't belong to an affinity group. You can, uh, you can join the affinity group of people with no affinity group. But everybody needed to participate in an affinity group and, and groups that were that participated more were given uh, a little bit more say in how things were happening because they were teams. And I think the Dream Act movement has another thing. It, when they formed Congresses, they they allowed people to participate and have voting rights or some levels of participation, but only if they formed teams. teams. They allowed people to be there and watch and participate, but not at certain levels. In, in this way, people realized that if they wanted to really be part of the movement, they had to form a team from the get-go, and that the power was not as an individual, the power was in the team. Yes. Thank you, Bob. 
so now let's talk about my favorite part mass training da 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 da, da, da. mass training okay so mass initiation training pretty much when you have new people and you want them to form teams for the movement now there is two situations you're going to find yourself with team the first one is well carlos i don't have any freaking momentum nobody wants to talk to me my movement is not hard whatever i don't know what to do with myself great don't worry, that's fine. I've been in that moment plenty of times, you know. <laughs> I've been in the moment I think most times, you know. And there actually there is a way to do that. So you have to think about mass training in a context when you don't have momentum and when you do have momentum. So I'm gonna talk about the both of them. Now let's talk about when you don't. When you don't, uh, my recommendation is this very simple formula, which is if you're the organizer or the key leader, you meet with 15 people that you think are good people to meet. You meet with 15, you have one-on-one -on -one meetings, you hear their stories, you hear if they care about the issue, if they care enough about the cause. Then, uh, after that, you tell, you bring those people together in a first team meeting, right? Usually just a five to seven. So if you have 15 or 10, you clean up to the leaders that maybe you think are not interesting and you only invite the five to seven. You have to understand this. People are going to the meeting because they care about you, about you and your relationship to them, not to the movement. Because the movement doesn't have momentum, doesn't have anything to give them that they can think is uh, credential or, or confidence. So they are, their confidence is in you and the way you show up at the meetings. You have the first team meeting, and actually I have samples agendas of this for the people that want to know about this. And, but essentially, you sh people share their stories, they talk about the cost, they talk about the importance of the cost. Again, because you already identify the leaders, you know that what they're pretty much essentially going to say, unless they've been lying all of them to you, you know. <laughs> but if you hear, you're going to hear the same things they told you repeated in the meeting. This is going to create an effect that is going to say to people, "Holy guacamole! I thought I was the only one caring about this on my town. There is another five people happening." And then they will tell you, well, "What do I do?" And you give them a presentation of the DNA. You tell them, "This is the story that we're about. This is the strategy, right?" And this is the structure, right? You give them those three things, and then people get a chance to give you thinking about it. Are they committed? Then you tell them, if you're committed to this cause, you can join it. And then you and then they say yes. If they could say no, that means you gotta go back and get new leaders. Or some people might say yes, only three out of five, that's fine. You work with whoever gives you the yes. Then you tell those people, okay, well, the first step is now we gotta all of us get trained on this stuff. And those people mobilize their networks, and you do a 30 to 50 people mass training. I hope that's simple enough. Paul? I just, I just want to say this, that in, in standard uh, structure-based organizing, from the dominant tradition of structured organizing, the Linsky tradition or the union organizing tradition I came from, uh, the first two steps are, are very similar, actually. You do one-on-ones. You agitate people individually. And it really takes, you put a lot of energy getting the first committee meeting. And it's very powerful when workers in the department all show up for the first meeting, mm -hmm. having shared their story individually, and now they share it with the group. It's very cathartic. You know, it's emotionally, they're like, I'm the only one. Oh, my God, I thought I was the only one. Now there's other people, okay? And that, that formalizer gels this, this, like, sense of solidarity emotionally. But this is the difference between the structure and the momentum is that then you use that to actually get them to form a team and you instantly put them into a two-day training. Now in the union and the structured tradition, we would not do that. That would be considered insane. They're just new leaders. Why in the hell would we send them to a two-day training and expect that they're going to run their own team, right? But in this structure, that's what you do because um, you're going to create a great system for them to rise and to support them so that their teams can function. Thank you, my brother. So let's talk about the other one then, Tim. What if you do have momentum? And actually, Paul and I developing this webinar, we had a lot of talk about this part. What do you do if you have momentum? And as you know, I, I, I run a training institute called Movement Mastery. And I love training. And I've done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of training. <laughs> and what I notice is that I always think about why don't people do training? Because this is what I think. If you do not have training in your organization, you're screwed. I mean, in any institution, 
like look at corp the best corporations they will tell you they have great training systems you know great organizations have great tra I mean everybody that is doing good work has a training program of some sort or formation or in the church they call it formation other people call it discipleship people have elements of training and education of their members and getting people to understand what the organization is about and I always think about for me that has you know it, since uh, working with Marshall Gans to me that became so clear in my head that I always did training for everything. Everything was training. You always had to do training, even at the actions, you know. And I always thought, why don't people do training? It's because people never schedule them. <laughs> so they always think that they don't have the capacity to do it. So this is what I would say. Let's say you get a big trigger event, a lot of momentum. Maybe you get a one over the whirlwind, which you know happens once in a long time, right? The first thing you should do is you should say, we're going to do a training in two weeks or in one week, depending on how much preparation you have had in advance. Again, Paul and I are recommending that you should already prepare your curriculums and your trainers before you even escalate. Before, not in the middle of it, because they might all be in jail. <laughs> you got to understand this. So you got to prepare that capacity and put it a little bit aside as an investment before the training. Some of you or some some movements might not have that. You'll be like, dude, we already hit a one. What do we do? This is my thinking. Is schedule it. Say it's gonna happen in two weeks. Okay? So then what happens? If you put it in two weeks, within one week, you can have a train the trainers. Meaning that if you just have one leader that is good, that leader can train another 20 people in doing the training. It doesn't, it won't be the best training in the world. That's fine. But you know what? People in the movement, they just need basic information. What is the story? What is the strategy? What is the structure? People just even need to freaking hear it, you know? So you spend a week doing train the trainers. You really prepare to trainers. You, you know, and of course, the week before you schedule it, you go to Facebook and you say, we're doing 20 trainings and you schedule them all across or you schedule five trainings in regions, you know? Then you prepare the weekend before you train the trainers. And then you spend a whole week mobilizing for those trainings and getting your trainers to those places, doing logistics and also doing the preparation. So to me, that's also the other way of how you can do mass training where you have momentum. Now, you might say to me, Carlos, we don't have the capacity. If you schedule it, you will do it. Most people do actions without having any capacity. They say, we're going to do 100 or 1,000 people civil disobedience. And I'm like, you only have 10. And they're like, no, we're going to do it. And it, and it happens. Because when you plan it and when you schedule it, you have a deadline, you do it. So that's what you would do when you have momentum. Paul, anything you want to add, brother? So I want to say why it's different when you have momentum. Because when you have momentum, the momentum is replacing the one-on-one -on -one relationship and the one-on-one. -on -one. So you already have tons of people all around the country that are asking you for training. So... What you need to do is just create the most basic structure as fast as you can. If you're well prepared, that training, like even before you escalate, before you get the momentum, well, then it's going to be a good training. But what we're saying is it doesn't really matter if you have momentum. You skip over that part of finding, targeting the leaders, recruiting them one-on-one, -on -one, and trying to get them to mobilize because there are already enough people to show up to a training. So you just have to schedule it. And you just got to prepare, and something is better than nothing. You got to get it to them as fast as possible. And really, when you have momentum, the the real choice is between whether or not you have a train or you don't. That's the question. <laughs> yes. Because you, you the the opportunity is there for you if you have the momentum. The momentum is there. After 2006, we had a million point two. We could have done trainings with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Even if we had limited capacity, we could have done it because they, they have this phrase in organizing, 80% of organizing is actually getting people to show up. Like that's where most of the resources is involved. In the structure tradition, there's a concept that actually getting people to actually show up to the meeting is where most of the energy and the time of the organizer is spent. But when you have momentum, none of the energy is spent on that. You don't have to worry about mobilizing people because the momentum mobilizes people. So then you, all you have to do is create the structure for the momentum to be absorbed. Thank you, Paul. Okay, team. So let's go. This is the last part of the training. We're just going to take maybe seven minutes to talk about this whole thing, and then we're going to open up for questions and end the webinar. But there is 
four things that we think create sustainability and support if you think about an ecosystem for our teams, right? We said, first of all, again, I'm going to review, right? We said the seeding process and having a core that is, if you think about three things, right? First is the seeding process that we have a core that is really giving the DNA to people, harnessing the DNA, talking to new leaders. Then we talked about mass training, which is a process that has to be constant, right? Now think about there's another quick four elements that create a lot of love and care for your teams to keep going. Kind of the, the water and the sun to the seed so they can grow and become crazy. I become very uh, poetic, Paul, after this one. So I got to admit, I'm loving this one. So four things. Mutual aid, you got to make it fun. You have to have a lot of constant training. Training never stops, okay? Training never stops. Intensity, intensity. And the last one is constant communication and coordination. Let's go through each one of them. Paul, mutual aid. So what I mean by mutual aid is in professional organizations, structured organizations, you have a staff. Or a lot of times you have members, that, like union members, that actually get something from participating. They get rights on the job. They get health benefits. They get certain things for participating. But a lot of times the staff is actually paid, so they get certain things, um, concrete things to meet their needs, their financial needs, take care of their family, whatever. Most of these decentralized teams, all, almost all of them, are run by volunteers. So why are volunteers going to participate? They're going to participate because of all this informal coordination to meet their needs. Okay? So in some ways, that's how you pay people. You pay people in the aid, the mutual aid. And a lot of times, people don't think about this because they're like, oh, people are participating because they care about the cause. Well, that's true, but actually a huge portion of what keeps people going is whether or not their emotional needs are met in the group. And when you do public narrative, you find the, the deep values that people have and you find the deep goals they have in their life, to be a better father, to be a better leader, to, to, to be able to, to heal some anxiety or depression, to be able to have a community that they feel supported by. So you need to be able to, to really have as part of the philosophy supporting each other in uh sorry, I can't say that word, but <laughs> in mutual aid, and that, mutual aid. that space is about creating deep bonds that we, we naturally do in our family, we naturally do with people we love. We create mutual aid systems, right? Um, if you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you have a lot of ways in which you support each other. You don't pay your girlfriend, right? You don't they don't have like a professional position, but you have to think about that in a different way and people aren't used to that because they're used to participation in a company or a business where where they're getting money or they're getting prestige or status. Instead, we got to think about how to take each other's needs seriously and if people are reaching out to the group around personal needs that they have, um, whether it's projects, whether it's emotional needs, like they're, they're feeling anxiety because their parents are coming to town or, or, or they're, they're scared about getting a job because they don't know if they don't have papers. Um, or, you know, there's so many different needs. Or, or they just they have personal development goals in their life. They want to be a leader or a better father or they want to be um, better at relating to people uh, or being a leader. You need to think about how to meet those needs. If somebody is in a crisis or in an emergency, the team needs to think about how to support their team members. And this is really what we pay people to participate informally. It's what people bring people time and time again. You talk about 12-step, what gets people? And if you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, people show up and spend thousands of, they volunteer thousands and thousands of hours as leaders of Alcoholics Anonymous or the other 12-step programs. And why do they do that? They do that because being a leader also gives them things that they need because they're addicts or it, it helps them in so many ways. We have to think that our teams are not just Obama campaign teams that are just doing canvassing. We have to see them as actual communities that provide mutual aid. And the two elements, I think, is you have to you have to, your team has to learn how to listen and meet, try to support and meet people's needs when they ask for them, and we, we have to learn how to teach people how to reach for uh, 
the team for their emotional needs. Thank you, bro. That is so important. So one, we need the mutual aid. And then the second part is we have to figure out how to make this fun. And really, team, this is this is actually a, a picture from a training we did in, in the UK in London a couple of months ago. And some of the people that went to the training told us, like, oh my god, if I knew it was gonna be this fun, we would have come without like being dragged into here. <laughs> so this is I think a part that has to make teams survive, which is like we need to make this stuff fun exciting you know has to be emotional and uh, you know a lot of people complain that when we go to meetings say well why do we need to schedule the social time or the party time or the fun time if that time is not scheduled then it won't balance all the work of the team you got you know we gotta really think about this because people are doing all this work for the time they need time to decompress right uh, so some examples are cookouts, dancing parties, doing murals together, doing good nannies, you know, karaoke, singing together, really stuff that builds. Co Other people will tell you this is community building. It's the same thing. We just sort of call it mutual aid and make it fun, you know. But if you notice, at least for me, movement mastery and in the work that I've done with Dream Movement, everything is a party. We are everything is excitement, is high energy, is emotional, is rewarding. It feels you, make, it makes you feel like a better human being. I mean, that's the point of the whole thing, you know. And then the last two is constant coordination. And this is to me very, very key, Be, which is that if a team is not meeting once a week, it's really difficult for the team to sustain. Like if the team is serious about doing work. I mean, there's some time you meet once a month and stuff. But if you're actually in the movement, you have to do constant work. You need to meet at least once a week. And the way that I see this is that you have to, people have to enter that time they're going to meet with you every week and commit their time. You have to be in their calendar or the team needs to be in each other's calendar to make sure that that's going to happen, right? Either in a, either some examples are weekly conference call, meetings, right? And I really had in SIM, in my organization, the Student Immigrant Movement in Boston, I had this rule that we needed to have retreats every three months because I saw that after three months, people will plateau in their learning and we will kind of need to convene again. There will be uncertainty. So, you know, this meeting every three months or at least having a retreat where you have kind of large guidance of the campaigns is very important. And, just, Paul, do you want to do the last one? Well, I just want to say what the constant coordination is. Um, when you're, when a lot of times when you're organizing and you're a core leader or you're a staff of an organization and you have all these teams, it seems like it's so much resources to do a weekly phone call. And you're like, is it, are we really getting a lot out of this? I mean, isn't it kind of a waste of time? People could be doing their own work. Or getting people together every three months in a Congress or where all the groups get to communicate with each other. And when I was, I was uh, helping coordinate a national boycott with the hotel and restaurant workers, and Dave Glazer, who is an, a, an amazing organizer, um, did these three-month, conferences with all the different boycott coordinators around the country. And to me, it seemed like a waste of resources. But I ended up thinking it was I was totally wrong because there's a lot of informal relationship building and coordination that happens if people are relating and have a relationship. And you have to build that coordination in that organization and the, the time in there or else it doesn't happen. And that will happen naturally between the teams. But you have to put it on the calendar. You have to create the structure for it. Carlos? Okay. Looks like Carlos is no longer with us. Belinda? Hey. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened to Carlos. I saw that his computer was low on battery or something, so maybe that's it. Um, <laughs> but this was pretty much the end, was it, or do you have more slides? We have one more slide. I will talk about the one more slide right now without you seeing it. <laughs> so the last slide is constant training, okay? And what I mean by continual and constant training is that the core to facilitate the ecosystem of groups needs to constantly find out uh, what is the missing skills that are there? What are the things that the groups don't have? And because you can't order teams uh, to do things, you have to train them. Oh, that's great. You have to train them. And how do you do that? You do that by mass training. You develop uh, 
mass training to disseminate information and in, in the, the Serbian revolutions in Octpor in, in, called this upgrade training. Is as a core, you need to figure out what is the missing skills and education and things that need, what's the missing element of the ecosystem, and fill it in by creating new curriculum and giving it out to the entire group. Another thing you need to do, which is similar as, as upgrade training, is you need to find the people who have the resources. If there's somebody who's creating great posters and doing great graphic design, and they know how to do that, and their, their team is just wildly ahead of all the other groups in the skills to do graphic designs, then they, you ask those people to train other people and to create an, a mass upgrade training for everybody else. And one of the biggest examples of this, and I've seen this time and time again, is that once you have a really good campaign or an action, for instance, I'll give you an example of this, is uh, it's, United Students Against Sweatshop. I was involved in this part of the global justice movement. There was this campaign to get schools to divest uh, from sweatshop companies to form a new sort of accountable system of monitoring um, these places where clothing apparel was made for universities. And the campaign uh, did the sit-ins. And then when they had like a model of sort of how to do a sit-in and how to do an escalating campaign around getting their, their college campus to divest from these apparel uh, companies that were uh, using sweatshops, they created a training and they created this big pack of how to do it and they gave it to every single group. And they did conferences where the people who had already done the sit-ins did the training to all the other groups so that it pushed all the groups that were in lower development into up, and up into doing what was the most effective replicable action. And you can see that around a lot of different campaigns. When there is something really good in the, in the civil rights movement, there was the student sit-ins in Nashville and Greensboro, well, those guys developed a great campaign. So as a core leader, we want to, to systematize that into a mass training so that those people's good work and best practices can be disseminated to everyone. And that doesn't happen naturally. You have to really um, have that as part of your DNA. Um, so uh, you, and also, this, this is the last thing I want to say, and I think Carlos can speak a little bit about this, is that a lot of times organizations are stalled because the higher levels of leaders, uh, leadership, is not developed because you're so focusing on formation and developing teams that you don't have higher levels of training for organizers. And because of that, it stops people from taking higher levels of commitment because they're not, no longer getting leadership development. They're no longer feeling excited about the movement because they're not developing. And a lot of times, too, it, it, creates, it creates a dependency on the core who's the only ones who have those skills. So you have to figure out how to develop um, training for higher levels of engagement, higher levels of the ladder of engagement. And I, I think uh, Carlos can kind of talk about that because I think that was a problem in the DREAM Act movement. Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Bell, is the, is the other is the other user. The other yeah. user. Th this recording is going to be a little fucky. It's okay. <laughs> there you go. No, no, no. I think we want to show people how do you act, do webinars when you have momentum, you know? meaning when you have thousands of participants in the phone calls. Uh, okay, so team, we think uh, this is actually the last slide, which is what Paul was mentioning about the continuous training, which is that sometimes you, uh, look, you go through this investigation process and you try to anticipate what are all the problems, what's all the things that could happen. But in reality, you're not going to anticipate all of them. There's going to be a certain percentage of problems that you cannot. And as your organization moves forward and as you do more escalation, you're going to engage, your movement is going to engage larger problems that you don't even know uh, or that maybe you do know, but you don't know how to train new people on it. That's why we think that training has to be continuous, meaning that you have to really offer advanced training. And in the dream movement, we saw this a lot, which we had a lot of basic training, meaning that everybody knew how to do three or four things well. But not a lot of people knew how to do high strategic thinking, which is what we should start doing is training on how to do campaign development and much more training. And a lot of leaders at the end felt uh, 
kind of disengaged because they were like, you're not providing us for our basic needs. And, and, and our network was like, well, we don't have enough support for training. And that's one of the reasons why I created Movement Mastery was because I knew we just needed advanced training to keep going, you know? Uh, so that's the last part. I don't know, Bell, if, we, if people have any thoughts or questions or reflections around what's been useful, what are aha moments, or how are, or how are they processing all this stuff, you know? Totally. Um, so we, had, we actually had Dante join us for like a few minutes there. That was fun. Um, and Nestor had to leave, so Leland is the only person online right now. Um, but yeah, so Leland, is there anything that jumped out at you? Anything that was interesting or unclear or that reminded you of something? He said, I'm love, wow, that was a fast, long response. He said, I'm loving this, especially in the beginning when you don't have momentum. People are coming just because of the relationship with you. Uh huh, that's true. And the, you know, get these 10 core people in the room and they all go, wow, I'm not alone. And that all effective organizations have regular, well formed trainings. So important. And whether or not you have capacity, schedule training and you will do it. <laughs> And the once you have momentum that replaces your one-on-one -on -one relationship as a motivation for people to come, um, he said that that felt very informative. And oh my gosh, thank you, emotional care and support for people to become whole in their lives as part of the movement heart. <laughs> Wanted to hear that in a long time. But he said that's exactly what we need. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Lila just wrote that like, what, two seconds? What's up with that? <laughs> Yeah, he actually submitted a follow-up comment that said he was typing it along the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Paul, Belinda, any closing statements before we go? Um, I thought this was really great. Um, and I know that I felt really frustrated in the climate movement because I was in that position, Carlos, where, that you were saying that people felt like, you know, that they, they wanted that more advanced training and they didn't get it. Um, so that's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very important, but this was great. Thank you guys for another great webinar. Any last comments, uh, Papa Smurf? Um, I just want to say that, uh, this is a different way of organizing that I think that the Dream Act students have done really incredible. And actually I go to Carlos for advice on this stuff because, uh, I, I was not trained to do this a little bit in the global justice movement. We did this, but we didn't have a very good ecosystem. Everyone was sort of off on their own and we had times of relating. So there's informal coordination, but there wasn't the mass training or a real understanding of what a good unity would be to help the autonomy, you know. So um, I just think it's really amazing. And when I study the DreamHack students, uh, they, they're just they're constantly doing mass initiation training. They're constantly forming new teams. Um, they're constantly uh, they have a coordinator that just trains teams in the best practices on fighting deportation, which is a huge replicable action that all the teams do. And that training is incredibly helpful for each of the groups. But it's not coordinated from the top. It's coordinated from the bottom. The top is really just training the groups yeah. to do the activity. And that's a whole different way of orienting. That's a whole different way. In the labor movement, we don't do that. We go and we organize different um, companies or different food service companies on different campuses to organize. But what if we were thinking about how do we support them to act autonomously to run their own campaign? And once you do that, you unlock the key to exponential growth. That is something that is, is very rare, and when people see it, it's amazing. And even the DreamHack students, they had no money. They had no money. The DreamHack students didn't have any money whatsoever, but they became one of the most powerful bases within the immigrant rights movement. Still to this day, the, the, the Dream Act students can mobilize more people than almost any of the other immigrant rights organizations. Even though they, and they kind of resent this, they don't get the major foundation money that a lot of the lobbying and advocacy groups in Washington, D.C. do. So how do the Dream Act students do that? With no money, create this huge organization that's sustainable. It's because they, they really thought through how to do decentralized teams. So I really want everyone to think not just about momentum, but also about decentralized organizational teams as the two major things that we're trying to give to the world.
Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much for leading that team. Next week, last webinar on actions and tactics. Paul's going to bring his best game on. I'm going to try to see if I can get as much game as Paul has, and we'll figure this out. So see you next week.